Keith Joseph, in whose honor this lecture is delivered, had the charm of a hundred paradoxes. He was a modest man, but unlike so many modest men, he really had nothing to be modest about. He was that overworked, but in this case appropriate word, brilliant. Yet he never indulged in intellectual virtuosity. He was brave, yet by nature he was timid. He could seem cerebral and remote, but he had a warm heart and impish humor that made his friendship an inexpressible delight. Keith was also unusual in that even when quite old and frail, he seemed somehow to remain young. The secret of this youthful spirit was the opposite to that of Faust, for in Keith's case, it was a fruit of innocence. Not the innocence of inexperience, let alone of insensitivity. This was the innocence of the pure in heart, of those who have wrestled with the evils of humanity while remaining unspotted by the world. Keith's goodness was shown by the little kindnesses which marked his dealings both with political friends and opponents. He had no enemies. But Keith was more than good. He was also great. And his greatness lay in his integrity. Integrity is an old-fashioned word. There are even some who will tell you it's an old-fashioned thing. But for a politician, integrity is everything. It's not just a matter of avoiding bribes and inducements. In our remarkably financially honest British politics, it is not even mainly about that, whatever learned judges may say about the matter. In politics, integrity rarely lies in the conviction that it's only on the basis of truth that power should be won, or indeed can be worth winning. It lies in an unswerving belief that you have to be right. It was not that Keith wore a hair shirt from preference. He was averse to any kind of suffering, especially other people's, and applying the right remedies to the British disease was bound to require suffering. But Keith's integrity was absolute. When he became convinced, finally convinced, after the endless discussions which were a mark of his open-minded, open-hearted style, that a proposition was correct, he felt he had to defend it. He had to fight for it. When he faced those raging, spitting, Trotskyite crowds at our great liberal centers of learning, I suspect he wondered sometimes whether he would have to die for it. But there he stood. He could do no other. This lecture is not, however, intended as a eulogy. The purpose of recalling the turbulent times of 20 years ago, when Keith Joseph and I reshaped conservatism with the help of a handful of others whose dedication compensated for their fewness, is that the same qualities as Keith's are required in our party today.